All right, in this week's episode, we are visiting with Johnny Stewart in Pennsylvania. Johnny just finished building his brand new hunting camp. He travels all across the country chasing public land whitetails, and you get to check out some of the bucks here in this video and hear the story. So we hope you guys enjoy it. Here we go. Hey everyone out there in the white tail world, welcome to my crib. This is my crib. I call it a camp, but most people to come here consider it a lodge. This place is um, in Northern PA. I actually live in Southwest Pennsylvania near Pittsburgh, just South of Pittsburgh. But um, since the hunting's been better, I started looking for a place to buy here. And actually a lady acquired this, it was just a camp 25 by 30. And um, she come over across the street and asked if I wanted to buy it. And then so, and that was that, I, I purchased it, it's been three years, and I put a lot of work into it, as you could probably see. But um, actually all the wood on the wall that you see were white pine trees that were standing, kind of right where that wall, that's a new wall, um, they were standing all along there, kind of along the property, and I um, had them cut down, and I had them milled, made into tongue and groove, and so the trees that were all along here are now back in the same spot pretty much, um, but just in a different form. I'm gonna take you guys upstairs and um, show you around a little bit. So actually it is um, gun season here in PA and we are out today. I actually harvest one the other day, I tracked it. And if you actually look out the window, I do have my deer still hanging in a tree over there. I tracked that one. We got a fresh kill for the white tail cribs. I don't know if you guys ever got a, a fresh kill when you guys were in doing a crib. So um, anyways, that's the upstairs. I grew up, like I said, in Southwest Pennsylvania, just kind of hunting, nothing managed, just kind of some private property, console property, public land. Um, this was my first buck. It was growing up, uh, if you shot a 10 point, you were something, so. I got him mounted and I think I was 16. My first bow kill was I think 17, but I did hunt probably four or five years up to there. I think you could start hunting 12, so yeah. This next one was uh, a West Virginia kill that I, uh, public ground that I remember this was back before maps and Spartan Forge and all them um, um, mapping things that you get on your phone. And so we knew mountain bucks as small buck and um, this was like, a wall hanger to us because when we went up in the woods and hunted I was looking inside the ears for horns and uh, I come around the point on a mountain and I'm looking by inside its ears it was rifle season and I said man so I shot him where I grew up it was uh like I said it was some private land and some public ground not kind of outside of the suburbs but the older I got the um suburbs took over they were putting up more houses more commercial and so we started hunting closer to houses. We learned that the deer were living, to, that got away, were living in closer to the houses. So actually this deer was one of the first ones I shot. It had his sheds for I think two, three years. And yeah, I just started hunting and especially bow hunting in smaller patches of woods because that's where we find them. So I had this deer's horn sheds for like two, three years. Actually bigger the year before. I don't think that, that's a shed from two years before. So I shot that one um, just right outside of someone's backyard um and actually um one over there we'll get to was in the same tree like a year or two later um so that was yeah kind of in a i don't know what you call it suburbs or hunting city bucks or whatever it is but this actual bigger deer is one that i shot when i was young 21 22 and like i said where i grew up there wasn't a lot of big deer but everybody you're a lot of spotlight and PA, and this was um, it was the biggest deer around that all the local people, it was the talk of the town, and um, it wasn't like some private ground. And um, I went in and when they shed their velvet, I went in and I was just looking for fresh rubs. And once I found all the fresh rubs, I just kind of started there as my nucleus. And I just kind of went out and I just, like I said, I didn't have a uh, any mapping. I just 
kind of grid searched it, you know, and found where that deer was hanging out. And I think it was October, early October, that I ended up killing him, but I went in the woods to hunt. There was an old railroad bed that I walked down with my bow, my arrow knocked. I used fingers back then. So I, um, and I knew he would lay on that slope there in the sun. So I hiked down that railroad bed and uh, there he was just bedded on the hillside. And I already had the arrow knocked. So it was just kind of like walking and, and I was like, and he was just laying in the sun and it was just like, so I shot him and it was, he's like a 150 class and like everybody and everybody come to my house and checked it out. And it was like, oh man. And then people told me, some of the guys around there was like, oh, you got lucky, you know, but I know it wasn't luck. I just, I knew enough then, you know, I learned enough then to kill a big deer. And then actually the following year I shot this one He's maybe a 120 class, maybe pushing 30. I don't know, but um, same scenario. That was a large buck back where I grew up and um, I caught him, I went before daylight and ride up and down the roads. I caught him crossing the road and going in down behind his houses. So I set up there and, and I shot that one the following year. And that kind of, after I got them, I was, my confidence in shooting some bigger deer was up. Let's jump back here. This is um, a seven point, that was a, late season public land deer, January, that's actual muzzle loader. And I got one over here, I'll show you that seven point gene is still in that piece of public ground. So this deer here, I actually shot, I think it was one of the only deer that I shot here in Northern PA that I have on a wall. Like I said, um, the last couple of years I built this place and so I didn't have much time to hunt. I shot this one two, three years ago and my friend Greg Litzinger was out here from New Jersey and I was wanting him to get a deer. So I put him in a stand and um, he ended up shooting this deer. He, he said he was, his wife really wanted him to get some meat to take home. So this is the first one to come along. He shot that deer, it was two o'clock and, and he said, uh, I got one down. I said, all right, I'll come give you a hand. And we were only 200 yards from the road. So I parked and I run in and we got his deer and he was kind of wanting to celebrate a little bit. And I said, all right, be quiet. Cause I said, I'm going to go get in that tree stand and shoot one. So his stand was still on a tree and, uh, we got his deer and, and I got up at his tree and, and this guy stepped out. It was maybe an hour and a half later and I shot him the next day. My other buddy, Jason, uh, was up here bow hunting. I said, Hey, we got a spot. Um, we shot these two deer and I think there's a hot doe. So he got in a tree at the same tree and he missed one. And then he shot one maybe three, four in the afternoon. So we shot three bucks in 24 hours out of that one tree, public land and 200 yards from the road. And this non-typical deer, this is from where I grew up. It was a piece of state land, Southwest PA. Uh, and this was actual bow drive. Me and my buddy devised a plan where he, he would push and there was an intersection um, to the road. And I figured the deer might jump across the road and get into this other patch. And I went down and got set up and he, he just started pushing and he had bucked just as textbook, which usually doesn't happen that way. He come right down in the woods and I shot him and that was cool. You know, before tra trail cameras and shit, you, you know, you don't, you don't know what you shot. You don't, you don't name them. You don't never seen them unless, um, you, you saw them hunting or whatever. But, um, and then the next deer, that's a, another public land deer. Um, I had a trail cam picture of him probably, it was the year before that I had a trail cam picture of him. And then I went in there to hunt that deer, the, that year I didn't do any good, but the following year I got up in a tree. I wasn't actually hunting that deer. It was just, there was another big 170 inch deer there that I, I was really confident in that stand placement. And there was a, a finger of timber that went up in, in this bean field and into the east, there was some um, CRP that I felt like they were gonna hit that finger if they wanted to travel west. I got up in my tree and I sat there and a couple of does come around me and the one doe would cough like, <coughs> it was coughing and I kind of knew that buck was close, maybe just standing there listening. He wanted to come my way. It was right. He was heading somewhere. So them does were around me. The one was coughing. I grunt, but this deer come running in out of nowhere and he stopped and it happens. That's what you, you sit in a tree for hours and hours and hunt. And then it happens like this and it's over and you're like, ah, oh. but, um, this is a, a public ground deer. I was on a ridge. There was a little saddle that I wanted to hunt, but the wind was just out of the West and it was. 30 mile an hour wind. So I dropped, I had trail cam pictures of him. I dropped over to leeward side and 60 yards, got up in a tree. And actually when I got up in a tree, 
his shed was in a patch of briars right below me. I said, oh, check that out. That's pretty cool. So half hour before dark, he come off the windward side and he come up over and on the my side. And I was like, oh man, that's where I was going to sit. I said, tomorrow morning, I'll get up there before daylight, get on that saddle. It was nice and calm. So I got up there the next morning and um, I seen him below me on the windward side, but it was real calm. And he was chasing doe and I actually gave a grunt or a bleat, the, the can or something. And a couple does came in underneath me and he, that buck ran out uh, to the north along the slope and 10 minutes went by and there was a little ridge that went down the slope and I looked at all I could see above the ridge was a rack coming up the hill like this at a side view of him coming up the hill and I was like oh man there he is so he turned he seen those does he looked at him he said Bruh. he just let a big grunt out and he come running from like 50 60 yards away he come running at those doe and they took off and here he comes on a pretty fast trot and I was able to stop him at like eight yards I just grunted at him and so that was that deer that's public ground and this one above him that was a public ground deer um I seen the deer the year the day before I saw that buck out in the field um there was a north wind um coming across the field and hitting the timber but I seen him out in that field off a point little point in the timber and the field kind of went back along that point and I seen him and some does feeding on that point in the field I said, well, tomorrow I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get up that point. And it was a north wind, northwest wind. And I did, and I put some dough and heat and, and buck piss under my stand. And I got up probably 35 feet just to, and it was like a 10 mile an hour wind, just so my wind would hopefully be above the animals because the timber didn't go up elevation wise too far. And so I'm just sitting there and I hear one little twig snap behind me. I'm like, ah. Oh. Cause them big bucks will sneak in on you. You won't even know it. I looked over my shoulder. He's standing and he's looking like he's sniffing and he's looking. He's like, where's that buck? You know, doe, whatever he was looking for. And he stood there for about three, four minutes. And then he just turned and he, he went down alongside me 30 yards and I took the shot. So yeah, that was a public, public land deer. And then this other one was a piece of private land that me and my buddy had. He just come in walking, following a doe 25 yards and I shot him, it was a little bit far back, it was a liver. We gave him probably six, eight hours, but we found him. This was a public land deer, late season, that was January. That deer um, was up in the forest and um, I, I, I found his track and it was actually kind of crunchy. I'm surprised that I walked up on him, but I, it was, I think he was so rutted out that he was just so wore down that he just kind of stared at me and I just shot him. That was a muzzle loader and like the back of his neck the skin was just loose I think he lost a lot of weight and he was just kind of out of it um and this deer here in the corner that's another public land that was a January deer too that was before I had I don't even think I had a range finder but I was pretty good at judging yardage and he was just coming out to a field and I judged 40 but I always aim low anyways because if usually if he ducks you're going to hit him if not you're just going to miss he dropped because I grunted at him and at the at the string and I actually hit him and then I stepped it off. It was like 54 yards or something. So he dropped a good bit and I, I got him. So that was that deer. This is a this is the other seven point that I shot in that same that I showed you the seven point earlier. But this one here, this was back when trail cameras first came out. Probably I don't know, 12 years, 10, 12 years ago. I had him as a Right now, he's probably four or five years old. I don't know how old he is, but I had him on trail camera picture at like 125 or so. I'm guessing maybe a three-year-old. But um, I hunted that piece of public ground, and I actually saw him maybe the first or second time I hunted. I opted to pass on him. Uh, I was looking for a bigger deer. So I end up uh, the following day, or I think that night I shot a 10. I don't know why it was some things you do. I'll wait for a bigger one. Then you sit and you're saying, I should have shot him. So a 10 point come by smaller. So that was, wasn't like I said, that was a couple years before when he was 125. So the following year, I actually put a blind up along that power line so I could see, see in the thick stuff a little better. And the following year I come back, I left the blind there. And so this is two years after I got him on camera and I, and I seen him, I, I come back the following year. I said, I'm going to get in that blind for an evening hunt. So I come down a ridge and it was like, you could hear a pin drop. It was so quiet, the leaves were crunchy. So when I 
got off the ridge and come down along the power line to get in that blind. I actually had my grunt call and I'd blow it just sound like a deer because I didn't I knew there were deer in the area and I would just kind of walk like a deer like hill toe kind of sound like a deer walking down the hill and I grunted and I got to my blind and it was like laying flat on the ground so I popped it up and I jumped in there and here he come right up that power line he was down there and it was like November 10th I think 8th 10th uh, and but he was laying down near the creek and he got up and he coughed like he was like so sure of himself he'd been using this travel route for three four years and he come up at power line and i shot him at 25 yards and when i shot him i didn't know it was the seven but then i recovered him and i looked at that trail cam picture and that was him and i found a shed afterwards these are some public i was one deer i tracked up here actually a couple years ago um, i was tracking a big deer and i used to i like tracking deer and but i'm a horn hunter and i would track a deer and then when he would jump even though it was a good track i would kind of score him on a hoof and I, I did that a few times and the buck would get away so I said this time when I track his buck as soon as I see horns I'm going to shoot it because I actually bumped him and I got a view of him and he was going up the hollow no other deer tracks and I said the next set of horns I see on a deer I'm shooting because this is the only buck out here I'm on his track so he's going along the going along the hillside and he angles down the hill on like a 45 degree angle and um, it's actually the deer that I jumped is Bo Martonic's deer. He shot two years later. I was tracking him two years previous. And I started sneaking down through some hemlocks and I, I seen a deer down there pawing the ground and eating. I seen horns and I just smoked him, you know. I said, oh, I got him, he's like 140. I go, oh, yeah, I got me a big one. Um, and I walked down there and I was like, oh, that ain't 140. And I said, what happened? Some ground shrinkage. And then, oh, right after I shot, I seen another deer take off. I'm like, whatever. And then, my deer died and I went down there and I seen him and I walked back up the hill and I got on the tracks and I was falling and the other deer was standing there. So it, it, I got some venison there, but yeah, that's what that deer was. And this was a, a, a another public land deer. That was late season. That was a bow kill. There was a actually warm season and there was acorns and I was actually hunting close to the road and I was getting my gear gathered up before daylight and in the woods, I heard deer fighting. I thought maybe someone was rattling, you know. It was uh, January 8th, 9th, I don't know when it was. And um, I was like, man, and there's no other vehicle. I said, someone, nobody beat me to that spot. Come on, I ain't no, I'm a diehard, you know. There's nobody out here in January getting out before daylight. But actually, there was two bucks fighting, and I parked. They didn't care, and I got in a tree. And as soon as I got up in a tree, the, um, a small buck come under me, and he was one of the ones fighting. He come from behind me, and I shot him, and I actually got pictures when he had his, his, all his tines. And that was another January deer, um, public ground. Muzzle loader, I actually shot that one. I remember I was real sick, and uh, I didn't spend a lot of time muzzle loader hunting. I said, first decent buck I see, I'm taking. And I was way back in the woods, I remember, and it was cold and down over this mountain, and I'm like, man. He was a big body deer and I, I was like dying. I'd drag him like a mile. I was like, holy mackerel, but you do what you gotta do, you know? But um, this one here, I left him here for last. Actually, this is his sheds. And this was a deer kind of where I grew up. Um, it was only 10, 12 years ago. This was a January kill and, and there was blinds and tree stands everywhere. And I let them other guys, I said, I'll get him in January when everybody gives up hunting them. And so I heard about him and I went and found this, that was a fall, winter, and then that spring I, I went and found, I never seen the deer, I just found his left side shed. And so the following year, like I said, I went hunting and I let the other guys go out and fall and put their blinds up in tree stands and everybody. I said, you guys ain't gonna kill him. He's, he's uh, He knows how to survive through that hunting season. I'll go out in January. So yeah, the following January came and I wanted to shoot him with a muzzle loader, flintlock in Pennsylvania. So I remember, um, I think that year I was hunting in Iowa, I drew a bow tag and I was hunting out there all year. And I drove all the way home. There was a couple of days left to hunt in PA. And I went, drove all the way home. I think it was, it was a snowstorm. It took me 18 hours to get home. I run to my house, got my flintlock and it was like a 30 mile an hour wind and you know, with a flintlock and it was snowing. That ain't real good for your flintlock. So I just pulled up, there was a little oil well up in the field and I just pulled up in the field and I said, I'm just gonna glass you cross the road. I know he lives across the road. And it was like, it was like this time of night, like it is outside right now. It's getting late. I said, I'll just, you know, I'll, I got the next four days to hunt him. So I sat in my Jeep and I see a deer over there. And then I put my binoculars down. He's standing in front of my Jeep. <laughs> I'm like, oh man. 
So he went up the hill. He, was, he had crossed the road, and he's just going up, and there he goes up the hill. So I said, I'm going to get up there the next day, and I got up in a tree the next day, and um, he, I had him at 75 yards with a flintlock, and it just went, pfft, the, the pan powder burned, and it didn't go in a barrel. And so then no bueno on that. I come back the next day, and I said, I'm using my bow, and I'm going to get up in a tree, and I'm not dealing with that flintlock. I want to be able to get a shot at him, um, get something to go off. And I remember it was maybe... 20 mile an hour winds, it was brutal cold. And I remember just sitting in my stand and I would just curl my toes and keep my hands warm. And I had a rough year that year. I had a lot of, uh, I hit, I was hunting Iowa for a long time on a bow tag and I was after 170 inch deer there and I wasn't shooting anything less. And I passed a lot of good buck up in um, the actual 170. I hit him, hit a limb, hit him on a leg. And then the second time I hit him, it was like I had three encounters with him. And then, so it was a whole year of hunting in Iowa and had like four missed shots, hit limb. Um, just, it was a bad year, one of those years where my confidence was down after so many misses and missed opportunities that I thought I wasn't gonna even kill a deer that year. So I got back to PA and I got up in a tree that last day and my I just had a negative outlook on my season and I was just sitting there and it was cold. And I said, I'm not killing a deer. There's one day a hunting season left and there's a big snowstorm coming in. What's the chances of this buck coming? And I'm sitting there, I take my release off, like getting ready to get out of my tree and two bucks come by me and they were feeding below me and I was gonna get down, but I'm like, well, they're under me. I'll wait a minute, just as I usually do. And um, they fed around me and I'm like, all right, get going, I'm freezing. I had my release in my pocket and my bow rope, my ro bow's hooked on my rope. I'm like, all right guys, let's go. And I look and here comes buck, I'm like, oh, here he is. I'm like, my hands are like numb. I'm trying to get, I had these big gloves on. I'm trying to get the row rope off and I'm trying to get my release and he's walking and he's on their trail because they cut the, you know, through the snow and he was falling. I was like, oh man, here he comes. And I was able to get my release on at time and I turned and shot him at 10 yards. So that's what that deer was. He was no one, you know, he was six years old and all the deer in that area were yearlings and two year olds. Like I didn't even see a two year old. They were all yearling bucks. Like he's the only one that he found a scene where he would travel and live and get away from this property owner and this and just, he had it mastered, you know? And I think the reason I was able to get him because they extended the um, hunting season in that area an extra 10 days to where previous year there wouldn't have been season in. So he thought he was home free, he made it. And so I was the only one out in a tree there hunting. So that was that. And I got that deer out of the woods and I, um, come back in March to get my tree stand. And I got my stand out of the tree in March and there was a little ravine down below me um, in the forest. And I said, well, I'll take a walk down and see if I find any sheds. And it was probably just a 10 foot down and 10 foot back up ravine that was down behind me a hundred yards. And I was at the head of it after I grabbed my stand and that was this other horn. It was laying in the bottom of that ravine. That was a pretty wild story. I Finally got the uh, other side in March, and uh, my taxidermist made it a little wider. He didn't help me out there a little bit. 